In Washington that same day, John Wilkes Booth dropped by Ford's theater to pick up his mail. A stagehand told him the president and General Grant were both expected to attend that night to see the actress Laura Keene in a British comedy called Our American Cousin. Booth told his band of devoted followers of a new plan. He would shoot Lincoln and Grant. Louis Payne was to kill Secretary of State William Seward. George Azarot was to shoot the vice president, Andrew Johnson. Early that evening, Booth led his horse out of the livery stable near Ford's theater. A young boy was told to hold it at the stage door. At the last minute, General and Mrs. Grant begged off the theater party and left the city for Philadelphia. The Lincolns arrived and took their seats in the presidential box. With them were Major Henry Rathbone and his fiancée, Clara Harris. What would you advise, Ma? Just remember, dear, he's rich. Hush, here he comes. Oh, Mr. Trenchard. We were just saying how you always seem sure of hitting your mark. The president seemed to be enjoying the play. His wife held his hand. Booth swallowed two brandies at a nearby bar, then returned to the theater. He waited for the laughter to rise, then slipped silently into the president's box. Augusta, dear. He held a dagger in his left hand a Derringer pistol in his right. A nasty beast. <laughs> Sir, your vulgarity renders you intolerable in polite society. Maybe I don't know the manners of polite society, but I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal, you <laughs> psychologizing old man trap. Booth fired, then vaulted over the front of the box, caught his right spur in the draped flag, and landed on stage, breaking his left leg. He waved his dagger and shouted something to the stunned audience. Some thought he said, Sic semper tyrannis, thus be it ever to tyrants, Virginia's state motto. Others heard it as, The South is avenged. For a long moment, the theater was still. Then Mary Lincoln screamed. The bullet from Booth's pistol had entered the back of Lincoln's head, torn through his brain, and lodged behind his right eye. A surgeon from the audience pronounced the wound mortal. Soldiers carried the unconscious president from the theater into a boarding house across 10th Street. We put him on the first floor and laid him on the bed. When we took him into the room, we had to get out. They wouldn't let anybody in without it was a doctor or something. Private Jacob Souls. The giant sufferer lay extended diagonally across the bed, which was not long enough for him. He had been stripped of his clothes. His slow, full respiration lifted the covers with each breath he took. His features were calm and striking. Gideon Wells. The doctors could do nothing. Mary implored her husband to speak to her and wept so inconsolably she was finally taken into the front parlor. Cabinet officers stood by helpless all night, doubly shocked to hear that Booth's accomplice, Louis Payne, had stabbed Secretary of State Seward then run out into the street crying, I'm mad, I'm mad. George Azarod had been too frightened to carry out Booth's order to kill the vice president. Around six in the morning, Navy Secretary Wells stepped outside and found the streets filled with silent, anxious people. A little before seven, I went back into the room. The death struggle had begun. Robert, his son, stood at the head of the bed. He bore himself well, but on two occasions gave way and sobbed aloud, leaning on the shoulder of Senator Sumner. 
At 722 on the morning of April 15, 1865, Abraham Lincoln died. He was 56 years old. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton said, now he belongs to the ages. His pockets contained two pairs of spectacles, a pocket knife, a linen handkerchief, and a wallet. In it were nine newspaper clippings and a Confederate $5 bill. Mother prepared breakfast and other meals as usual, but not a mouthful was eaten all day by either of us. We each drank half a cup of coffee, that was all. Little was said. We got every newspaper morning and evening and passed them silently to each other. Walt Whitman. The telegraph carried the news across the country in minutes. No president had ever been murdered. People would remember for the rest of their lives where they were and what they felt and what the weather was like when they heard what had happened. <laughs>